Okay, good afternoon. Um, those of you who follow Irish rugby will realise there's some significance in a Munster man taking over from a Leinster person. Uh, there's a long and strong rivalry on the rugby pitch between our two provinces. Um, but we do work together digitally very well. It's nice to be here. I come from Cork, which as you can see is the most beautiful university in the world. Uh, so it's nice to come to the second most beautiful university in the world and I'm glad to be here. Um, and of course, although his statue is slightly out of the picture, Cork is home to George Boole, who 201 years ago was born and whose logic added to the wonderful hardware developments of Gauss in Gothingen to make our entire profession possible. And hopefully that partnership and that spirit of partnership and international collaboration will continue and indeed does. So um, briefly, I don't want to talk a lot about it, but we, we have a long history of messing with computers in the humanities in UCC. Uh, we had the first web server in Ireland and the fifth in the world, which was created to support the Curia project, uh, which was led by now retired, but still active and fit Professor Donoco Coron. And that project took historical Irish texts from printed 19th century editions and scanned them and uh, transcribed them and corrected the digitization of the OCR and then uh, had them marked up in TEI. And that collection has continued and expanded over the years and it is still there. And a lot of the work was done um, in, by students in a third year seminar. So we, we, in the course of building the material, we used the students and we taught them how to scan and we introduced them to angle brackets. Um, so there's some examples there of stuff that we've done in teaching. Uh, there's a lovely diagram from the late 1990s of literacy in a small town in North Kerry uh, extracted from the 1901 census of population and done in Excel by a third year student. And, and if you read into it, and I could bore you for hours about it, um, you can see when the primary school was opened in that particular little village from the literacy levels. Uh, and there's some work there in farther down the screen, what you will recognize as a version of Voyant, uh, which is two historical texts from the Celt archive, um, from James Connolly and Michael Collins. And it's s images that I use in class of their use of the word civilization. So it's a classic keyword in context to show what these two different political actors meant when they used the word civilization. What was their concept? What of these two leaders of the Irish Revolution, how did they see civilization and what did it mean to them. Um, and of course, we've now advanced from the stage where, because our tools are becoming easier and more user friendly, um, we can not only demonstrate these in class, um, but we can also assign these texts to students. And we can not just assign one text to the whole class, but if we have a class of 40 people, we can assign a different primary text to everybody and we can tell them all and guarantee that they will very quickly be able to upload it into something like Voyant or put it into something like Catma and actually learn how to do some real analysis and see the results very quickly. And when you're trying to deal with undergraduates, it's important that you keep them amused quickly before they get bored and drift off. So um, we cast our net intellectually very wide. We ask our students what does it mean to be human in the digital age? Because the humanities are about what it means to be human. They are about the artifacts that we create, the environment in which we live. So I have a few slides that I call the scary slides, um, which students, young students can identify with uh, because a great many of them work. So they understand the impact of self-service checkouts. And they're all very familiar with that terrible failure of human computer interaction where the self-service checkout annoys you by saying unexpected item in the bagging area and you want to thump it. Um, and that allows us to discuss and introduce them to the idea that things like human computer interaction, user experience are part of their everyday lives. As is the idea that the way in which we interact with technology and how that shapes our humanity is changing. So for most of the 20th century, the road trip, the driving, getting your driving license was a fundamental part of growing up. And when you point out to 18 year olds who are learning how to drive and who are worrying how they'll pay for their car insurance, when you point out to them that in their lifetime, indeed in the next decade, it may become illegal for them to drive a car manually because a computer-driven car will be safer, uh, then you, you get a reaction. And then, of course, that allows you to ask the question, well, what will you do in the car? 
Will you read? Will you watch Netflix? How will this change the patterns of your movement? I have a final year project in the BA this year, and he's got four and a half million Uber records from New York, and he's building a data visualization dashboard, uh, which will be designed to ingest Uber data and visualize the journeys and understand what is the pattern of average everyday human movement around any given city for which he can get the data. Um, so we are able to sell this very much to the undergraduates, but we started off as a PhD program, which involved Susan and a number of other institutions. Uh, it was funded, it was the Structured PhD Program in Digital Arts and Humanities, um, which had its first intake in 2011. And um, it was um, four institutions, Cork, Trinity, Maynooth, and Galway came together to put in the funding proposal. Like all inter-institutional consortia, um, it was difficult to put together. There was negotiation, the different institutions had different requirements for what you had to do for a PhD and how many modules you could take and what was the maximum number of credits and what was the minimum number of credits. Uh, but eventually we sorted that out thanks to what I'm calling the causey Schriebman diagram. Uh, one day Susan and Matthew Causey from Trinity sat down and they produced a diagram that represented the curriculum nicely. And it made sense when they produced the diagram. And therefore, we said, right, that's the structure of the curriculum. That makes sense. And that allowed us very powerfully to sell that to rectors and vice presidents and funding agencies. We could say, look, here is the structure. We have some common methodological and core modules uh, in green. And then we have the arts and the humanities strands, where there are specialist modules for the arts and the humanities um, strands of PhDs. And that filtered through the four years of the program, and it also allowed us to sell it very clearly to the students. It was a powerful recruiting tool. It does, of course, there was a number of things about it which were hazards and risks. One of the things which is a hazard for digital humanities is um, that Matthew, who was one of the people who designed this diagram, has just retired. The retiring of the first generation, the people who are over 55, who are over 60, um, is a, a very real institutional risk, and it's one that's happened in a number of institutions in Ireland recently, and, and therefore we've had to deal with that and manage it. The other problem was, of course, that like all funding programs, the government funded the first cohort of PhDs. Uh, we put in for the PhD studentships, for travel, for some equipment, for some infrastructure, and also for some new blood lecturers. And the Higher Education Authority looked at all this, and they took the line that said new blood lecturers for four or five in all the institutions, and they just went, you're not having that. No new lecturers. You must carry on with the existing staff. So we did. Um, and the other risk, of course, was that they only funded the first cohort of PhDs. So the first 47 were all fully funded, and they were magnificent. One of them, James O'Sullivan, is presenting in Krakow this afternoon. Uh, another one, uh, Christoph Kudela, is in Göttingen, um, finishing off his PhD and working into the library system there and becoming part of the community there. Um, but the problem was that in the subsequent years, there was no funding for PhDs. And you can almost see that in the numbers in UCC. We had 10 in the first year, but then 5, 3, 3, 2. Um, for some of those, we got funding from the library to work on collections which our library possessed, but did not necessarily have full ownership of. So the Bantry House Papers, for example, the library wanted them digitized and developed and enhanced, um, but they didn't necessarily have the rights for unlimited use of them on the web. So the work is ongoing there, but there's negotiations about copyright. And those numbers really reveal, there's a bump, 2016, we did very well, and we're doing well next year already. But they reveal a fundamental problem and this is why we progressed on our way from MA down to, from PhD to MA and BA. Why the MA? The problem is our university has a regulation that if you are going to have a taught class, you must have at least six students in the class. Occasionally they will let you get away with it. But if you are providing a program for a PhD cohort and there's only three people in the cohort, then at some point in time the registrar will turn around and say, look, you only have two or three people in this class, you cannot keep offering this program. So our solution was to create an MA in Digital Arts and Humanities, and that would provide a solid base. For the PhD, we were pretty sure we would always recruit enough MA students to be able to keep offering those core foundational modules for the PhD. Uh, and then once we could get over that, we were pretty confident we could sustain the options and the electives. 
Uh, so it would feed into the PhD, and that's been quite successful. We have a number of people who did the MA, uh, which is largely a conversion program. It's for people who have a conventional arts and humanities degree with no digital components, and the MA essentially digitizes them. And several of them have gone on into the PhD uh, from that program, and they're very good, and they're doing quite well. We also have an online MA in digital cultures. It's kind of a version of, it's not quite applying for every grant in the world, but the university decided as universities do, that we must have online learning. And they decided the best place to start was by putting 24 MA programs online immediately. Um, so we, a lot of the MA in digital arts and humanities was delivered online anyway. The PhD was largely delivered interinstitutionally by video conferencing and seminars. So there was no real logistical problem in turning our existing MA into an online MA, except of course the university said, because it's an online program and it's new, it must have a new title. And all the modules must have new module codes because they're officially being delivered online, even though we were already quietly delivering it online without making too much noise about it. So we have two parallel sets of modules and codes which have essentially the same content, and in some cases there's an overlap um, in terms of the students taking the, the same modules, but it's an admin requirement. So we have a very long list of modules in digital humanities, but sometimes they're the same module. For undergraduate programs, there's two different things. What we had hoped to do and what actually happened. And what we hoped to do is very similar to what a lot of other digital humanities centers and institutes have done. We hoped um, to create a small range of options. I think it's very similar to what, for example, Helsinki showed earlier. We wanted two 2,000 level courses and two 3,000 level at first. And these were going to be the basic introductory core courses. Introduction, conceptual introduction to digital humanities. Um, it's a title we use for all our first modules um, at whatever level. It clearly flags this is the introduction and it's about the concepts. Um, and we wanted those to be flexible. We'd have a small number of students. It would be a minor. Um, so students would take English. 40 to 60 credits every year, and 20 credits of digital humanities that would round them out a little bit. It would offer us a sandbox to experiment to see how this teaching would go down with the current generation of um, undergraduate students. Uh, there was a significant degree of, of opposition from traditionalists who didn't want digital humanities in the undergraduate curriculum at all, and academics whose limited experience of computing was limited to um, using Microsoft Word, who developed profound opinions about digital humanities and learning outcomes and other things. Um, and, but our, our plan was that we would infiltrate, which is a word that's already been used, digital humanities into our big CK101 BA degree as one of the many subjects on offer. Uh, it's an omnibus degree. It takes in 800 to 1,000 students every year. And we, our plan, our expectation, and I said this to several senior academic colleagues was that the practices that we did, what we did in those modules that worked, would become diffused and widely accepted. And what we tried that didn't work, we would just not, we would drop that quietly. So it would be um, an experimental testing ground to gradually make much as possible of the big omnibus BA um, digitally literate. Well, what actually happened was, the government decided that they wanted more students doing information technology courses. And they would give money, extra money, uh, to all the universities for students enrolled in IT programs. So the government grant, um, I think they give us about 5,000 euro a year per student in the arts faculty, and they were going to give seven and a half for IT courses. Uh, so there was some humming and hawing and some discussion about how would UCC take up this, and eventually the registrar decided, and we found, we didn't ask, we didn't even know this money was available, and suddenly we got a message that the registrar has decided we will have a BA in Digital Humanities and Information Technology. I don't think we were actually asked what it was going to be called. We were just, and literally two weeks later, something which had been opposed by the people over 55 for years suddenly happened. Uh, and we had to design a full four-year degree program, and the first intake was to be in that August. Uh, so we, we went ahead with this. We had never wanted a direct entry degree program. One of the things that I'm afraid has been difficult is that it has become a little silo. Students who are interested in digital humanities come directly into that, 
Uh, and we get some very good students in, but I feel that as a result, we're slightly isolated from the big BA degree, and I'm not entirely comfortable with that, and it's an issue that I, I want to address and that we want to work on remediating. So this is what we came up with in my office one afternoon very quickly. Um, in fairness to the university, the computer scientists were also volunteered into the project, um, and they bring about half the degree. So they bring the half over on that side. Um, there is actually a handout um, which lists all the modules, so I leave it outside during coffee. Basically what the computer scientists bring is their multimedia stuff. So they have their big first year module about introduction to the internet and hardware and infrastructure that covers all the bases. Uh, and then the rest of the modules, there's a Python programming course in there, but the rest of the modules that they have deal with authoring, digital audio, digital video, setting up a web server, SQL databases, and that means that by the end of second year, before they go on to the placement, all the students are able to take a box, a server, cold, set it up, build a database on it, create web pages, manage a bit of security on it, do some Python programming, so we don't have to worry about that technical side, and that's very good. And by the time they finish, They've got the multimedia skills to do transmedia storytelling, to do interactive narratives, to do the sort of multimedia user-facing work um, that is important in terms of digital narratives and human interaction with the computer system. So, so they can do the front-end user interface stuff. The blue bit is a traditional humanities subject, 15 ECTS in first year. Uh, 10 in second year, 10 in the final year. So English, Chinese studies, study of religion, archaeology, economics. A lot of them do economics. It's a very popular minor subject. Um, it's not enough to qualify them as a teacher in the subject, um, but it, it gives them a minor in a particular subject. And then we have the digital humanities, which stacks up in three strands, the conceptual and theoretical strand, um, the tools and methods, which happens in the second semester of each year, and then the strand that I mostly focus on, which is personal learning in first year, digital tools for personal learning, managing your personal learning workflow. And then in second year, the wider issues of knowledge representation and knowledge creation and knowledge management. So there are three coherent strands. We start off um, with the same, we start off with the manifesto, a digital humanities manifesto, the introduction to the companion, Matt Gold's book on debates in digital humanities. Um, and we, we work onwards from there in first year, and very quickly they, they pick up, and we introduce them to the angle brackets. They meet HTML, they meet TEI. They meet that as well in the computer science side, so they very quickly pick up the skills and the conceptual stuff, and we're very aware they're doing a lot of lab work from the computer scientists, so we focus on the concepts, so they're getting not just the click here bits, but also the theoretical in sequence. And we get along very well with the computer science side of the team, so we have a pretty good idea from week to week what they're doing, and that works really well. Um, the big gap in the middle, of course, is the placement. They get a placement, full 12-month paid placement, or a year abroad, or an Erasmus year. An Erasmus year? Anybody's interested in taking students from Cork or sending your students to Cork? We're open for that. And then the final year is a capstone research project and a research seminar. So that's the shape of the degree. That's what we came up with. Um, and it's a good mix, it's a good balance. Um, these are the numbers. There is bad news in here. We have already talked about the PhD numbers. Um, and the MAs proved surprisingly successful. We now consistently hit about 30 because the MA gets government funding for um, arts graduates for reskilling. Um, so 30 is about the limit that we can supervise. We will refuse to take any more. We could, we could take 60, but we cannot. <laughs> Uh, deal with that. The BA numbers, as you can see, have gradually grown and continue to grow, and the number in brackets is the total. So the total number keeps growing, and that means there's more assignments to be corrected, and there's more feedback to be given, uh, and the number that's not there is the number of staff who actually teach on these programs. Which is that? Right. Um, and that's changing, uh, but for those of you who are accustomed to the staff-student ratios in UK or European universities where it's about 12 to 1, our number, if you do the math, is substantially larger. And that has certainly had a negative impact on the research productivity of the team over the past four years uh, because there's, there's a sequence of dealing with the admin, keeping the students happy, and what was research? We don't remember, but we'll get back to it. 
Um, so there is demand out there, and you will get people into a program, but it, it does produce problems. It has produced a big win, which is our active learning space. We got an old computer lab, we got money to rip it out, and we refitted it. There's touch screens. Um, we have, we're using Mirror 360, which means that any device in the room can be on the main screen. So I can and have walked in the door with my S5 in my hand, punched up the button for mirroring 360, put in the access code, and taught from the middle of the room using <coughs> stuff that I grabbed into right. Evernote so. 10 minutes previously. Um, and that's a big win with colleagues because UCC, there's a lot of people who are actively interested in active student-centered pedagogy, and they want a space where they can do experimental stuff. We control this space. We will only let people use this space if they're going to use it for active learning. And while they're using the space, we encourage them gently to use digital tools for learning, to use tools for collaborative work, to do, introduce their students to text analysis um, and things like that. Um, so it's a lever. Space on a university is a powerful yes. thing, and we have a lovely space that people want to use. So finally, there's the program arc. Um, the important part, I think, is, is the weekly colloquium. It's aimed at the PhD students. They all have to present at least once a year. But all the MA students are welcome and most of them attend. And the final years of the BA are required to attend because their blog responses to it are graded. So that means that once a week, Wednesday morning, and a lot of the first and second year of the BAs come as well, we have an event where almost everybody gets in a room, room about this size, number of people about this size, they listen to the PhDs, they hear the presentations, everybody speaks equally, everybody, a lot of the people then write blog posts afterwards and respond to it, and that is recorded, it will be live streamed going forward, and that, that creates a community which does not discriminate between undergraduates and PhD students, and we have some undergraduates who are good at asking hard questions of PhD students. So that, I think, more than anything else, binds the thing together. There is a one event. It's like the common space that DRI had. Um, so there's some of the pretty slides. One of our PhD students set up a press. One of our PhD students produced, MA students, sorry, produced an album for his digital artifact. How do you not give someone good marks if he produces an album of remastered music? And of course, the Cork LGBT History Project, which is being done with DRI as a case study in how PhD students can archive their research materials as they go along. And some of our other multimedia stuff, but I leave the last word to one of our first years. Uh, please close your browser now to complete signing off for Christmas. Great remark, thanks. Maybe one question and we can discuss on coffee break, okay? Uh, so, any question? Yeah, okay. So, oh, okay. Short one, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to know uh, who hires your student who stop at uh, M, M2 level? Uh, for example, did you make any surveys to know who hired them? And if they found work after they finish, yeah. those who do not uh, f follow uh, till PhD, because for example in France we we are obliged to show the ministry uh, where they are hired. It's very important. So I don't know if you have this practice. We do. Uh, it's not rigorously formal. The PhDs are doing okay. Um, as I said, James was in Penn State and now he's gone to Sheffield. Um, Christoph is in Göttingen, uh, Luke is in some UN research institute in near Vienna, and he's providing them with their open access platform for reprints, so that's what he's doing. So those are the ones that just come to mind. Um, somebody has set herself up as an oral historian in private practice. Uh, somebody else has gone into dance teaching. Her PhD was on, she used Arduinos for dance, for performance and she's gone into dance teaching. So that's off the top of my head of the first cohort, that's at least five PhDs. Of the MAs, it's a little bit more varied. Some of them have gone into libraries, galleries, archives, museum. One has set up her own business uh, in digital marketing and digital identity because her MA dissertation was about the creation of digital identity online and she got funding to start a business so she now consults 
And in fact, some people in the university hire her to help them develop their online social media presence. So we're able to say that a, an art graduate set up a business of her own, which, uh, in, you know, given the conventional things people say about arts graduates, that's, that's a big win for us. Um, some of the others have gone into, as I say, arts, local arts collectives. We have a lot of people who are, come from an arty background and who are interested in teaching or who practice or who, who you know, live as artists. Uh, and they've gone back to living as artists, both with some pretty hot digital skills. This one is, um, was a textile artist, but she's now learned how to work in, how to do photogrammetry and work in Maya and produce some fairly neat digital art alongside her traditional textile art, so that's supplemented her practice in that way. So we haven't systematically surveyed them as much as we should have, um, but we know that we have had success stories, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.